everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm the instructor for this course. Uh, and Welcome back to week two of Introduction to Lithic Analysis with Safe Cultural Heritage Group. It's been a pleasure so far teaching this course and so far getting to know some of you. Uh, so um, let's dive in. But first, I uh, just want to remind you that if you haven't watched the first lecture, I'd highly encourage you to stop right now and go back and listen to that one before continuing forward with this. But if you have already watched that, then let's move on. This is a slide from last week's lecture. Uh, I just wanted to review these terms and go over them again because they're super important and we're going to be using them a lot. So just take a moment to review these terms, artifact, attribute, anvil, blank, cortex, objective pieces, detached pieces. Um, there's more on the next slide. But in this lecture, we'll be expanding a little bit on artifacts, which are objects or specimens produced by human agency. Uh, anvils, uh, which are stones used as a bottom support for an objective piece that is being flaked. We'll also be talking more about blanks, uh, detached pieces that are potentially modifiable into specific tool form and cortex, which is the exterior or the natural surface of rocks. And we will also be learning more about objective pieces and detached pieces. Objective pieces are rocks or artifacts that are being modified by the removal of detached pieces. So they're pieces of stone that have been hit, cracked, flaked, or modified in some way. And these usually are cores, um, which is the, uh, the form that we'll be talking about in this lecture. But they can also be nodules, bifaces, and flakes. And we'll also be talking a lot about detached pieces, which are pieces of stone removed from the objective piece during modification. So it is the, uh, the flake usually, but these can also include chips, balls, blades, shatter, and other forms of debitage. Some more important terms that we'll be um, discussing again in this lecture include cores, debitage, flakes, uh, flint napping, flint nappers, hammer stones, and reduction. So um, we'll talk about cores kind of extensively in this lecture, but a core is a nucleus or mass of rock that shows signs of detached piece removal. Uh, so this is the piece that the detached piece is removed from. So like um, we discussed before, or objective pieces are normally cores. So you have the core, and once you strike that core, you have a detached piece would be your flake. And just as I mentioned before, a flake is a portion of rock removed from an objective piece by percussion or pressure. Um, flint nappers are the ones, uh, the agents, the human agents that are performing the act of flint napping, uh, controlling the fracture of the objective piece to produce certain forms of detached pieces. Uh, hammerstones we'll also be discussing extensively in this lecture. Uh, hammerstones are rocks used as uh, percussive objects to detach flakes from objective pieces. And reduction is just uh, another word basically for the flint napping process. It's the process of shaping an objective piece by detaching fragments. So uh, that's just the reduction sequence process. I also thought it would be wise to review and expand on the flit napping process as a whole. So um, this is just to start a discussion on that process. Uh, there are three components to this, uh, being the percussor, like we've discussed, the hammer stone, which is the striking object, the objective piece, which would be the raw material, often the core, and the detached piece is the product or the flake. Uh, in archaeological contexts, these are reflected as three distinct types of artifacts, being pounded pieces, which would be your hammer stone, or also a hard hammer, soft hammer, or anvil. Uh, the flaked pieces would be the pieces that are um, being worked from. So that would be the objective pieces like cores or shaped tools, also including retouched tools. And then there are the detached pieces, which are flakes, bladelets, debitage, uh, flake, uh, blade and bladelet fragments, debris, and chunks. Within the napping process, there are some different techniques that can be utilized falling either within direct or indirect percussion methods. 
Uh, direct percussion is when the blow is aimed directly at the raw material. So this, uh, the best example of this would be handheld percussion, which is when you're holding uh, the, the objective piece and the hammer stone and you're hitting the hammer directly onto the objective piece would be direct percussion. Indirect percussion would be when you're using an intermediate object such as antler, bone, wood, or stone, um, placing it onto the core and then using it as a sort of punch, um, which is then struck by the hammer. Uh, this facilitates uh, highly precise blows, often producing punctiform, which are very small striking platforms. We'll talk about uh, the different types of striking platforms in the next lecture, so don't worry about that. And so indirect percussion would be when you have the core, and then say you have an antler tine that you're using to uh, specifically, precisely blow on one small area on the core. So you would have the antler tine uh, used as a punch. So uh, instead of hitting the actual objective piece itself with the hammer, you're going to hit that intermediate piece instead. And that is going to, um, that is going to focus the blow of the force into a more precise location. Um, and there are different methods of napping that fall within these. Uh, pressure flaking is when uh, you're placing a retouched object, um, such as bone, wood, antler, or stone, against the edge of a flake or a blank and applying direct pressure inwards to remove small precision flakes. So this is how you would make uh, very precise tools such as um, arrowheads and so on and so forth. Bipolar flaking is um, known as the bipolar technique as well, is when the object to be worked is placed on a stationary surface. So you have your core on the stationary surface, and then um, you strike the objective piece with a hand a held percussor also. And so this uh, distributes the force a little bit differently. And anvil percussion, which is the most basic, is when the core is just struck directly onto a stationary object in the anvil. Now that we've talked more in depth about the process of flint napping, I wanted to address the individual components in a bit more detail. So we're going to be starting with hammers, which are the percussive objects which are used to detach flakes from objective pieces. So uh, hammers are generally an object used for hitting the raw material to produce a detached piece. Uh, the purpose of hammers is to transmit force to create a fracture in the objective piece itself, and they are often in archaeological contexts characterized by pitting scars produced during the napping process. For hammer stones, uh, they're often concentrated along an edge, and for antler billets, they're often concentrated at the rounded tip. Um, and so you can see this in archaeological hammer stones and antler tying. Moving on from hammers, we have cores, which are the primary type of objective piece. Again, the definition of a core is a nucleus or massive rock that shows signs of detached piece removal, often considered an objective piece that functions as a source of detached pieces. A core is basically any raw material from which a detached piece has been struck, and it can be identified archaeologically by the presence of negatives or flake scars on the surface. So you can see in this diagram, uh, it's an actual photograph of a flake that has been labeled accordingly to the different components, uh, position of platform, negative bulb of percussion, cortex, ripple marks, and negative flake scars. A lot of these uh, features that you will find on cores are the opposite of what you would find on a flake. Going more into detail on these parts, we have at the top of the core, the napping platform, also known as the striking area and labeled here as the position of the platform. We have also the napping surface, which is the area where flakes have been removed from. Um, this is the area where during napping flakes will continue to be removed from. Scars are the previous flake removals and the scars are divided by ridges. So ridges outline each individual scar. 
Uh, and then you also often have the bulb negative, which is labeled here as the negative bulb of percussion. And you have the edge, which is basically the area between the napping platform and the napping surface. So uh, the edge is the area between the position of the platform and where the flake scars start. And then you also have generally the cortex, which is the natural surface of the raw material. Having talked about hammers and cores, it's now time to talk about flakes, which are the pieces that are detached from objective pieces during percussion. Um, there are different parts of flakes, so we'll be talking about those as well. First, you have the dorsal, which is the exterior face. I like to refer to it as the back of the flake. The ventral is the interior face. I also like to refer to it as the belly of the flake. And then there's the proximal end, which is the area closest to the platform, and the distal end, which is where the flake terminates. And there are, on the dorsal side, there are flake scars uh, and ridges, just like there are on the core. And there are some more parts that we'll discuss in the next slide. Some other important aspects of flake morphology include the bulb of percussion, uh, ripples, undulations, also known as waves of percussions, uh, fissures, also known as hackles, and the edge, uh, the butt, also known as the striking platform, the point of percussion, and sometimes irelia or bulbar scars. Uh, so here you see the bulb of percussion, which you, we did discuss last week, so you should be a little bit familiar with this. It is where the force of the impact is directed to drive the flake off of the core, and the ripples generally follow along with the bulb of percussion to reflect the directionality of the strike, uh, as do the radial fissures, which are usually along the outside of the flake. Uh, the edge is just the entire edge of the flake, both dorsal and proximal, or both uh, dorsal and ventral faces. And um, often, um, the irelial scars will occur if the force is great enough to uh, basically explode the bulb, uh, creating a flake scar where the bulb of percussion would be found. And the butt or the striking platform is the area here where the impact actually did occur on the core. Just expanding a bit on the last slide, uh, as we said before, the ventral uh, side of a flake is also what I like to call the belly of the flake. It's characterized most commonly by the bulb of percussion down here, as well as ripple marks that indicate the directionality of removal radiating outward from the bulb. Ripples are sometimes also referred to as compression rings. And there are also sometimes fissures or hackles, which are radii usually originating at the margins of a detached piece on the ventral surface directed outward toward the point of applied force. And these reflect the conchoidal fracture of the raw material. And here we have the dorsal side of a flake, which is characterized by flake removal scars, which you can see here is a ridge running along the middle side, indicating there are two previous flake removals. So these are two flake scars, uh, which uh, the dorsal, as I mentioned previously, is what I like to call the back of the flake, also known as the exterior side of the flake. And it can indicate uh, often what stage in the reduction sequence the flake is associated with, such as, uh, for example, the presence of multiple scars indicates a flake produced further along in a napping sequence, as opposed to a flake with a lot of uh, cortex indicating uh, something not so far along in the napping sequence. Um, flake removal scars uh, are also referred often in literature as negatives. Uh, so in flint napping and lithic analysis as a whole, termination is a concept that is really important to interpreting flakes. Um, and termination is basically just the way in which the flake itself uh, detaches from the objective piece. Um, termination types are related to the reduction process, such as poor selection of platform or bad angle, lack of force or lack of preparation, and can sometimes be indicative of lack of skill on the napper's part. Uh, and sometimes they're just plain accidents, um, luck of the draw, you know. Um, but uh, they're often referred to, as I've mentioned previously, napping accidents, uh, which are errors in the napping process often related to poor platform selection or lack of preparation. 
Uh, faulty terminations such as step and hinge are uh, examples of napping accidents. There are four main types of flake terminations. The first we'll talk about is the feather termination or continuous propagation. Uh, this is when the force is distributed so evenly that it just feathers out and tapers to a very fine tip where the flake detaches from the objective piece to at a very thin, fine point. Uh, this is the ultimate goal when flint napping. You aim to achieve a feathered termination. Another type of termination is the hinged termination, which is an increase in bending force, which causes directionality to change away from the objective piece, as defined in the textbook Technology and Terminology of Napped Stone by Anitsen. It is the removal whose fracture plane, normal in its uh, proximal part, arches suddenly and intersects prematurely the upper face of the blank, resulting in a rounded distal end, making the blank shorter than expected. This is um, what happens in some cases when not enough force is applied when striking the objective piece. Another form of termination is the step termination, which uh, is a discontinuous propagation of force uh, leading to an abrupt termination. And um, this basically is somewhat like a hinged termination. However, the step ends more abruptly, whereas the hinge produces a sort of lip that's rounded at the edge. A step termination is just flat and plain. And a step termination, like a hinge termination, also occurs when not enough force is applied during the strike. Another type of termination is the plunging termination, which is an increase in bending force causing directionality to change toward the object um, the, or toward the objective piece. Uh, it's also known as an overshot termination and is produced by an excessive force that rolls back toward the core and removes part of the distal end. And I know this uh, probably seems like a lot, so we're going to stop here and hopefully you're not overwhelmed by all of the material we've covered. Uh, if you need a refresher, just review the lecture again uh, until you're comfortable. Also, please feel free to reach out with any questions that you might have. Uh, in addition to this lecture this week, I will be adding some supplemental diagrams, such as the ones I used in the lecture, to the classroom uh, to correspond with what we've talked about in case you do want some more material to help you grasp this a little bit better. So keep an eye out for those. Um, aside from that, just thank you again for joining me, and I'll see you next week.